seen anything like this before. That many strikes of lightning in one spot. Get back. Oh, take it. Oh, we're going to fall in. Get back. It's freezing. Oh. Hey, move. Shot over 73 days, Spielberg's 2006 adaptation of War of the Worlds, based on the novel of the same name, is an epic reimagining with an intricate production process. Featuring an all-star studded cast including Tom Cruise, Miranda Otto, Tim Robbins and Morgan Freeman's sultry voice as a narrator, it follows a man struggling to protect his children during a catastrophic alien invasion. Hey guys, what's happening? Niet here with Film and Comics Explained, and as requested, today we're exploring Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds. The prolific English writer H.G. Wells is known for many of his works of science fiction, from The Time Machine to The Invisible Man, among more. His fourth novel, The War of the Worlds, was published in 1897 and describes an invasion of Earth by a force from beyond the stars. Wells has said that the story was inspired by England's colonization of Tasmania. Over the course of 40 years, almost the entire population of indigenous peoples were wiped out due to mistreatment and disease. Wells essentially wondered what would happen if an alien force did to us what England had done to the Palawa, and following through on this would create one of the best works of science fiction in history, one that has remained in print for 125 years and undergone numerous adaptations. One of these, and perhaps the most outlandish due to the mania it caused, was the 1938 radio drama version produced by 23-year-old Orson Welles. Our army is wiped out. Artillery, air force, everything wiped out. Maybe the last broadcast. We'll stay here to the end. It was developed as an episode of the radio anthology series, The Mercury Theatre on the Air, but due to the typical news radio format of the first act, listeners who missed the introduction to the show actually believed that aliens were invading the planet. The strange creatures, after unleashing their deadly assault, crawled back in their pit and made no attempt to prevent the efforts of the firemen to recover the bodies and extinguish the fire. In the novel, the invaders from space are Martians that have depleted their resources on Mars. They first land in England using artificial cylinders, large transport vehicles carrying four Martians each, as well as several disassembled parts of their various technologies. According to accounts of those unfortunate enough to see them firsthand, the invaders are described as having greyish-brown oily skin, two large dark eyes, and V-shaped mouths surrounded by tentacles. Thankfully, unable to cope with Earth's gravity and atmosphere, they spent most of their time in their vehicles. Attempts at peace and communication were initially made, with soldiers approaching with white flags, but they were abruptly incinerated with heat rays. This serves as a tipping point for the conflict, and as the army prepares for war, the Martians assemble their unearthly technologies. Their first horrifying weapon is the fighting machine, aka the tripod, a towering three-legged giant armed with tentacles, a poisonous chemical weapon referred to in the novel as the black smoke, and heat rays that quickly turn their foes to dust. <laughs> Next is the handling machine, designed to aid in the construction and disassembly of technology. Only slightly taller than a human, their solid metal frame rests upon five robotic legs. Tentacles, a running theme with Martian technology, are used in conjunction with extendable arms to lift and attach heavy machinery. Now, the flying machine doesn't really have a description, due to the protagonist hearing about it from another character, but what we do know is that it was used to spread the black smoke, and as a means of transport. Finally, we have the embankment machines, uh, essentially autonomous digging machines that widen the surface of landing sites for increased protection. As the story progresses, we soon discover that the resource they're running out of is food. They also don't have a digestive system of any kind and subsist on the nutrients of other beings, namely the nourishment in their blood, which they obtain through transfusions. Interestingly, the Martians also possess several unique traits. They don't require much sleep and can function for days, weeks, or even months without rest. 
They also communicate almost exclusively through telepathy, though they have been known to mutter a single word throughout the novel, Ula, which seems to be their war cry. Without their singular weakness, an immune system vulnerable to the germs and pathogens native to our planet, all of humanity would have been wiped out. I wanted the tripods, number one, to be really scary because they're going to represent what's driving them. So I want the audience to say, okay, okay, it's just a machine, let's get to what's inside, let's see the aliens. In 2002, Spielberg and Cruz worked together to produce the sci-fi masterwork Minority Report, which we've covered on the channel in the past, links in the description. With its success, they were eager to work together on another project, and one of the pictures Cruz gave the director was an adaptation of War of the Worlds. Spielberg, being intimately familiar with alien films, having made both E.T. and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, jumped at the idea immediately. He loved the idea of making an edgier, scarier alien movie, in contrast to his previous, more light-hearted ventures. I wanted the audience to actually be terrified by what these things looked like from the outside. So I had the most amazing group of computer graphic artists working on the design of the tripods. The writing duties fell to Josh Friedman, whose script was then rewritten by David Coe, who'd previously written for Jurassic Park and Mission Impossible. Both writers had the difficult task of modernizing a story written in the late 1800s. We went back and researched all of the wealth of design interpretations that have been done today. And part of it was to be conscious of what had been done, but also to steer away from that because we want to create something new and unique. They changed a number of things, including the origin of the invaders from Mars to an unknown planet, and the location of the main events from England to North America. They also changed how the aliens arrived on the planet, discarding the cylinders in favor of tripods that had been buried in the Earth thousands of years ago. You just don't want to do what everybody else has done. And I think he just probably was thinking, well, they always come from space, so he just said, well, what if I go the other way? What if they come from underground? The project was filmed over the course of 73 days, across locations in Virginia, Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, and California. The immaculate special effects were carried out by none other than Industrial Light Magic, who worked closely with Spielberg to bring his vision of the aliens and their technology to life. I got all the experts from ILM who had been working on episode one, two, and three for George. And with three wrapping up, I was able to take most of the team, Dan Gregorin and his unit. Now, Spielberg wanted to keep the tripods close to the original description, but drastically changed the appearance of the aliens, making them more amphibian looking and jellyfish shaped than the brains with tentacles from the novel. Interestingly, the effect of the humans being vaporized by heat ray was too complex for the computers at the time, so those scenes were actually mixed with digital and practical effects, using real dust to realize the human remains. When you start analysing the movie in the 72 days, which is an incredibly tight schedule we shot it on, and you see where the demarcation line is, the dividing line between actual stunt work and ILM stunt work. The film opens with a narration by Morgan Freeman, explaining that intelligent beings from another world have been plotting against the Earth for centuries. Across the gulf of space, intellects vast and cool and unsympathetic regarded our planet with envious eyes. We're then introduced to our main cast, Ray Ferrier, a divorced dock worker played by Tom Cruise, and his children, Justin Chapman's moody teenager Robbie, and Rachel, an eccentric child with an anxiety disorder played by Dakota Fanning. Put him up, Rachel. Make the arms. This, space. Uh, this is yours. This belongs to you, right? You're space. safe in your space. Nothing can happen in your space. Robbie and Rachel are dropped off by their mum, Mary Ann, played by Miranda Otto, before she heads to Boston to visit her parents, and it's immediately clear why they are divorced. Ray is a selfish, self-centered person who can't be bothered to take care of or connect with his children. Blackjack. I'm allergic to peanut butter. <laughs> Since when? Birth. Everything changes when a mysterious storm rolls in and violent, seemingly targeted lightning strikes occur near their home, disabling everything from cars to watches. This car just stopped and You're okay. go away over and over again. You all right? And me and this other guy, we climbed Where the hell did you go? Over on Lincoln Avenue. When he goes to investigate, a tripod erupts from the ground, immediately causing destruction and chaos. Running back home, he grabs his kids and makes a break for Mary Ann's home, using the only working car in the area. But upon arriving, they find that she'd already departed for Boston, and so they decide to rest in the basement. Terrifying flashing lights, unearthly noises and explosions then rock the house during the night. When they leave the next morning, they are horrified to find the neighborhood decimated. We've got some kind of shield around them. We can't see it, but everything we fire at them detonates too early before we can get close enough to cause any damage. Those machines come up from under the ground, right? So that means they must have been buried here a long time ago. The terror continues on their way to Boston when they're overwhelmed by a mob who want their car. 
The three of them are then forcibly ejected and watch in horror as people kill each other to gain control of the vehicle. When they come across a military battle with the aliens, Robbie forces his father to let him join the fight. And as the idiot disappears over a hill and into a series of explosions, a tripod suddenly appears, forcing them to shelter with a madman named Harlan, played by Tim Robbins. There they avoid detection for several days, and even manage to stay hidden when several of the aliens investigate their hiding spot. It should be noted that Spielberg's aliens almost entirely resemble the tripods from which they came. They have the same triangular shaped head, two large dark eyes, and three thin yet flexible limbs. Shortly after this encounter, they notice red vines creeping into the basement from outside, and a red mist being sprayed into the air. They then witness a tripod harvesting blood from a captured human, which they realize is the red mist being sprayed outside to help them terraform, sending Harlan into a crazed state that forces Ray to kill him off screen. Despite this, they are nonetheless discovered by an alien probe and captured. Now within the tripod, Ray uses a belt of discarded grenades to destroy the machine from the inside, saving many that were also trapped. Inexplicably and out of nowhere, the other machines begin to act erratically and fail. Ray notices birds landing on a tripod, indicating the force shields have been disabled, and the troops are able to quickly bring it down using missiles. Ray and Rachel then finally reach their destination, where they're reunited with Marianne and Robbie, who somehow survived. And the film concludes with Morgan Freeman telling us that the aliens were unable to withstand the microscopic beings that inhabited the Earth. What's the matter? Got a splinter. Oh. Where'd you get it? Come here. It's gonna get infected. No, it won't. Yes, it's gonna get infected. No, it won't. When it's ready, my body will just push it out. My dad gave me the greatest gift, an opportunity to apply my imagination to things that he first introduced me to, like the mystery of what's out there, and like the certainty that we are not alone. War of the Worlds was released on June 25th, 2005, and made back its production budget within a week. The film received generally favorable reviews, with most praising the adaptation and the special effects, but a few jabronis complained about the abrupt, unfulfilling ending, despite it being a direct copy of the novel's ending. At the end of the day, the film is an enduring work of sci-fi. Spielberg's vision of the aliens, the horrifying destruction they cause, and the madness that inspired in people trying to survive is riveting to see played out. But with that said, of course, we'd love to hear what you guys thought about the film, so please share that in the comments below. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and uh, yeah, if you have any other suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.